so much for joining me for another episode of the Shorsha Speaks With podcast. And today I am delighted and honored to be joined by Sierra co-founder and author Roberta Williams. So hello, Roberta. How are you? Hi, Shorsha. I'm very well. Thank you. That's, that's great to hear. It's, um, it's great to speak with, as I told you before, I'm a huge fan of adventure games and your adventure games. But we're here to talk about your book, which you've written because you've now moved to writing books and novels. Um, so we're here to talk about Farewell to Tara. And um, I'm looking forward to, to discussing it. So I was wondering if you could uh, let us know, first of all, um, what is this book about? Um, first of all, if you could get us started. Well, it's about um, the, I mean, the, the broader story is that it takes place in mid 19th century Ireland, um, principally in, in County Meath, Ireland. Uh, and it is, uh, it takes place during the Great Famine. I thought that that was a very, very uh, important time period to talk about, an, an event, a uh, catastrophic event to talk about for the world, really. Um, it's not really well known and understood anymore, although I know that in the 19th century it was a huge deal. And in fact, it is uh, thought of as the most catastrophic event in Europe of the 19th century, which very few people really realize now. And the changes cultural for Ireland, for the United States, Canada, uh, somewhat England and somewhat Australia, but really major for the United States and Canada and Ireland what happened during all that and it was and it was an important story and the reason why i focused in on that was uh, uh i'm i'm generally known for writing computer adventure games and way in the past and uh was pretty good at it that was uh which is interactive stories interactive storytelling on computers and um i was retired about 20 years ago and I just, I started getting into, I was looking for something to do, kind of a project, something. I'm always busy and I, I have to do something. And, and uh, my uncle, for, for whatever reason, he sent me some little stories that he had written. And my, my uncle uh, sort of, uh, his name was Merritt Clinton. He, he uh, fancied himself a writer. And he sent me some little stories that he had written and I was reading them and one of them was, uh, he had sent me some little biography or, yeah, I guess you'd say biography of our Irish ancestors that came over from Ireland. And I read that and I knew that they had come from Ireland, of course, but I didn't really know much about them. And I read that and it intrigued me. Uh, and then he wrote that they came from their names, Patrick Clinton, Clinton, and, uh, and, and Margaret Lochran, that they had come from a place called County Mead, M-E-E. -E. And I went, oh, you know, and that intrigued me and I was looking for something to do. And, I, and, I, and this was about the time that Ancestry.com and MyHeritage and Roots.com were coming online on the internet. And I just logged in and I started looking it up and uh, I found out there was no such thing as County Mead. Uh, that it's really County Meath, and I, I just started. I, you know, I became uh, I, I became a member of Ancestry.com and these others, and started just digging in. And I found that I loved it. I loved just looking into my ancestry, and I found out that I'm really good at it. Uh, but I wasn't able to find all that I needed, so I, I hired a professional genealogist out of uh, Ireland and, uh, and I, uh, I wanted her help to help me get some documents and whatever she could do. And I wound up work working with her for a couple of years and I kept her very busy. And, and so she was looking for documents and whatever she could find in Ireland for me. And in the meantime, I was constantly on ancestry.com and all these, everything else I could find. Um, from Ireland and ancestral sites and Mormons and everything, and was amassing. I mean, I I have an, I have notebooks. I have three mo notebooks. <laughs> Each one just filled with documents and notes. And then I I called to my various. Uh, I found out through 
internet searches, a lot of the uh, my uh, my family in America that still live mostly back in Iowa, but some in New York and some in Texas and some in California and some all over the place. And I just did a lot of cold calls and I, I started cold calling people. And then when I, I talked to them, I said, is there anybody else I can talk to? You know, and, and oh yeah, you should talk to aunt, you know, Lillian, whatever. And when she, you know, you should talk to her. And so I, they'd give me phone numbers. And then in Ireland, I, I was able to contact quite a few people in County Meath, Ireland and called them too, or sent them emails. And I got in touch with a lot. So I did a lot of interviews kind of like you do uh, with these people to find out more and more that I could find out. Family lore, what did you hear? What did you think? Um, and then I went to Ireland, I visited them twice. Uh, and I, most recently I spent five weeks in Ireland in 2000, summer of 2019. So I have amassed a <laughs> lot of information. Just, and then reading, just reading, reading and researching, researching. And the story, what I found out about Patrick Clinton, Margaret, Margaret Loughran, who eventually met in New York in 1870 and they married and here I am, I'm one of the results of that. I, they were born, uh, Patrick Clinton was born just prior to the um, onset of the famine and Margaret was born during it. And I was interested, I, you know, I knew their parents, but this time I knew their parents, where they lived. I even, I even knew the property and the actual, um, the lots um, that, especially the, um, the, the Lochrans lived on. And I visited it um, each time I've been in Ireland, I've actually gone and looked at it and, and it still belongs to Lochrans. And I, so I had all this and I've got, I've got probates and wills. I mean, I've got tons of information <laughs> and I, uh, I could just see the story formulating. I could just see, I could see the story, story formulating. And when you look at it, I, you know, I, I don't know the daily, you know, what did they do daily? Where exactly did they go? What did they think? What did, you know, you know, what did they say? I have, I have no idea on that. Nobody can ever know that, but I know the broad outlines. And I started thinking, I need to tell this story. Um, and I've got so much personal information and I feel very empathetic toward these people who I am calling characters. Mm -hmm. uh, they, are, they were actual people, but I am characterizing them, making them become characters who live at this time and they have lives and they are going through experiences and each family. But what the interesting thing is that each family was very, very different. The Clintons were your, um, your poor Irish laborer of the time, very, very poor. And they didn't have, you know, really any land. They, they had like an acre or two acres an acre um, of land and they basically lived on potatoes along with whatever else they could grow uh, they had a cow or a pig or and they and they made do as best they could that was the Clintons the Lochrans were what you call uh, and, and it, this was really hard to discover in my research but there is something called a strong farmer back then and the strong farmer might be classified, if you would want to put it in today's world, as sort of middle class, maybe a little upper middle class, but definitely not rich. And maybe not even in the well-to-do uh, category, but definitely above the poor laborer. So it, probably middle to upper middle class, but farmers the strong farmer. And that was anybody, any, any family that might have 20 acres or more and up to 150. And past that, you start getting into the more, you know, the land, land holder, landowners, landholders um, category, the, the elite. So the Lochrans were in that category of between 20 acres and 100, 150 acres that they leased, of course, 
we were um, Roman Catholics. So in that day and age, the Roman Catholics had no way of owning any property. It, it was against the law. And in this book, I, I, I say, why? You know, why mm. could they not own property? They're Irish. I mean, but it was literally against the law. And I just couldn't believe that. So that got me into the politics and then the, the, um, the rebellions, the, uh, the Irish rebellion, re rebellions going way back, the English incursions, um, it just all of it to try to understand why the Irish were treated the way they were, why these, these penalizing laws had come into effect and how that all, um, how it all kind of created the famine because it was really just about potatoes, mm. which then comes back to, well, why? Why is the fact that a potato dies and, and it can no longer grow and people die and emigrate because of that reason and changes the culture completely. And, and so I delve into all of this back history into the myths of time of Ireland the, the different battles and conquests of the English and how that happened, and how that relates to the famine. And th this isn't the only famine though. There have been many, many famines in Ireland. And I go into that too, but this was the worst. Yeah, that's what's surprising. I mean, wh by reading the book, you can tell that you've done a lot of research because as I told you before recording, it, it's very authentic. It feels like I'm right there. It feels like I'm reading a, an historical account of the people who lived at that time. Um, but it's, you know, and that's one of the things that surprised me when reading the book that apparently there was a famine in 1835 as well. One of the people in the <laughs> yeah, book said, I which I, I didn't know about. <laughs> yeah, I mentioned, I think in it, I, um, I, I have characters talking, of course, this is written. I use my own family as the main characters, which, I thought was um, it was unique, of course, but it also was dangerous a little bit as far as story writing, because it could be seen as a family genealogy kind of thing that only family members would be interested in reading. And I didn't want it to be that. I wanted it to read like an, an actual novel and fiction. It is fictional. In, that, in the sense that um, I am taking these people that really live, but I really am fictionalizing them and giving them personalities. Um, but, it, but during it, there's a lot of dialogue between characters. And one of the characters, one of the scenes mentions, uh, they're, they're, talking, they're talking about the famine as it's beginning to start. And, and they're worried how this is going to affect them and their families and Ireland in general. And they're worried. And one of the characters mentions, oh, I remember the famine, you know, of uh, 1835. And, you know, this this isn't going to be as bad as that, you know. <laughs> and of course it was. It was even worse. Yeah, when I was so reading I do that go scene, back. yeah. When I was reading that scene, I was like, wait, there was a famine in 1835 in Ireland? <laughs> because we didn't read about that in any of the history books here, at least from what I remember. Uh, right. So I, I am learning <laughs> while reading the book yeah. and, and enjoying it as well. And another thing that uh, struck me as well, you mentioned from uh, your family, the Lochrans, I believe, who were the- The Lochrans. The Lochrans, the, the strong farmer that, they actually, mm -hmm. a lot of them benefited from the, uh, as you mentioned in the book, that the poorer laborers that they unfortunately either died or emigrated and then the landlords, they became weaker as well. They lost tenants. Mm -hmm. So uh, that, that's one- It was the strong farmers that, that, uh, that kind of came out as bandits. <laughs> in the end, I mean, to put it in those terms, but in a way it's true and because uh, you know, the Lochrans had, I mean, there were various family members of the Lochrans, but, but the ones more directly that is in my direct lineage, um, they had, uh, like Brian Lochran had 44 acres, um, and this would be Irish acres. Mm. Um, and had 44 acres of, of land. That's his farm. That was his farm right on the River Boyne. And, and that was, that was uh, it's pretty nice, pretty nice land. It was really nice land, just about a mile and a half, two miles south of Navin. And, um, 
and so he was directly in this this kind of this nice you want to say nice um uh, uh position of having this this amount of acreage he was still he was still um leasing it he didn't own it but as time went on it, uh, other other farmers in this category of between 20 and 100 maybe 150 acres in this category they they all they all leased the land but they survived the famine pretty well whereas the the poor laborers did not they were the ones that were starving and dying or emigrating um, and but but the the very rich landowners who had thousands of acres or hundreds of acres and thousands of acres they did not do so well because they depended on all of these poor laborers um, sometimes in the hundreds that would be on their property and paying rent working their fields for them and and that sort of thing and when they when the laborers started dying off or leaving or whatever they did then the the rich landowners no more they had they didn't have they lost their labor force and they couldn't afford their own property themselves but these strong farmers these middle middle group they didn't have that problem and they just kind of kept going i mean they, it's not they didn't go through it like like great but they survived pretty well and on the other end of it they were actually able to for the most part increase their holdings and then later when you know there was the final um and i haven't gone forward into this time period of ireland but the, when was that in like uh 1922 or some when was the we got the independence Republic uh, yes, the, the the republic. There was the the war of independence from between yeah. 1921 yeah. and then it's 1922 that we got something like. Yeah, I uh, haven't I haven't done the research on that. <laughs> oh well, that, that's very, that is that is really interesting. That's, I was uh, very I was very concentrated in this one time period. Yes, <laughs> but uh, but um, but the strong farmers, so like the Lochrans, they were able to after. 1922 and the, the independence they were able to keep their property now suddenly now what they had leased for 50 60 70 years and just kept renewing the lease renewing the lease renewing the lease they were able to that was theirs they could keep it they, they own the property oh that's and good so that's Fine. how <laughs> that's one reason how they were able to do it yes and because they're yeah, no, because there's uh, finally they're able to, you know, become owners of their own land. Owners of their own property, right? Uh, because there is uh, another scene going back to the Clintons of poor laborers. Um, there's a very powerful scene with the eviction scene, which uh, you put up on your website as well. And but I mean, it's a it's a very powerful scene for different reasons. Also, because one thing I love in your book is that uh, the families are very close knit. You can see that. Uh, husbands and wives that they're very close together and they help each other and I don't want to give anything away but in this scene uh, where the wife actually comes out to help her husband that she's not going to be cowering on her own in a corner <laughs> that she comes out to defend and she's herself. eight months pregnant too yes. <laughs> Which, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. now, now you mentioned that yeah. you, you fictionalized uh, these but did, did some of these things um happened or were you told some of these stories that you put in the book um as well or did you fictionalized most of it so did some of these events in the book uh, really happen? happen that you're aware of that you were told well you know at the end of my book there i have a notes section and if okay. you read my book you'll see i have little footnotes sometimes you yes. know i'm writing and i'll put a little footnote and especially on the kindle version version you can click on that little footnote and it'll take you right to my notes and you can read and and i explain some of this where i say something like um well, this scene didn't really happen, uh, but I, uh, but I imagined that something like this very well could have because they were in this category of of people, um, uh, or absolutely the scene happened. You know, um, so it I do try to explain some of this where there might be questions as to well, did this really happen or that or where did I learn this or how did I know about 
what the cottages look like back then and and that's and that sort of thing and and I kind of put in my footnotes but um I don't want to say which scenes are actually true or not true but I would say what I this is the way I approached it was everything that I knew for sure I put into the book and I noted that in my okay. notes when something was true, they actually did live here or they actually did this or that or were friends with so-and-so or um, or their their relatives were actually so-and-so. Um, but this, but uh, obviously, no matter how much research you do, and especially coming from that time period in Ireland, records were not well kept and many were lost. And in the case of Navin, there was a terrible fire in the records. Uh, there was a, um, wherever they, they kept their records in Navin, um, the, there was a terrible fire. And it, I think it was something like 1927 or something like that, where much of their records were burned up. Well, which was really bad for me because a lot of my family is from Navin and their records are there. And so some of those records were just gone and there's nothing you can do about mm. it. So, uh, and, but I did meet with uh, Lochran's in, um, or in Lochran, uh, and they're not necessarily with Lochran, some of them are Murray's and, and Farrelly's, but uh, I met them and talked with them. And they gave me also more information of what they knew from what they had heard from, you know, they're talking. So anything like that, that I learned about, I wrote, I put it in the book or had been told to, uh, I talked to relatives who live in Iowa, for instance, that's where they eventually settled is in Iowa through New York. <laughs> and well, what, did you ever hear anything about uh, grandma Margaret from back then? You know, what did she ever tell you any stories? And they told me some stories and I, include that you're just you're just now meeting the Lochrans where you are reading yes but I get more into it now you're going to read more about the Lochrans and you're going to discover more how their lives were different and took a different um route than uh than the Clintons oh, I'm looking but, forward to it. <laughs> and I put those things in but I in order to create the story what I did was you take what with the actual events that were happening in Ireland and in County Meath at that time, politically and, um, and just historically, what was going on, and especially in County Meath. And County Meath is an interesting county because it's also known as the Royal County of Ireland, and it has the Royal Seat. Of, uh, the, uh, of the High Kings of Ireland, which is the Hill of Tara. And so history goes way back in County Meath. And I found that very interesting too. And so I put a lot of the ancient history in the book too, as, especially as it concerns Tara. And I found out that, um, that Daniel O'Connell had a yes. huge <laughs> rally, you know, uh, to, uh, for the repeal of the, um, Oh God, what was that called? Um, oh, the, I should know. This. The, <laughs> the repeal of the Land Act, I think it's. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's just repeal it's of the right union. Of I know. I I just read this in your book. But, I know. Uh, I know. I know. <laughs> it was a big deal. Anyway, and, Daniel O'Connell. And, and I he, studied this at school, so I should know this as well. But <laughs> I know you just read it. I, I know what you're talking about, but and I, I wrote I, it a long time ago. So. <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, it uh, it. Um, he had Daniel O'Connell, very, very famous. And when, we, when yes. I was in Dublin, he has this huge statue. A statue, and O'Connell Street oh, is the main street in Dublin. <laughs> super important to the history of Ireland. And I took lots of pictures of the statue and, and everything. And, um, but he, he did these monster rallies. And, but his most, what I think maybe one of his most famous monster rallies was on the Hill of Tara, which really pleased me a lot because that's right where my family was. And, he, and here's how I can best answer your question as to what was fictionalized and what 
since they're from County Meath, and they were, uh, and they did not live that far from the Hill of Tara, and they certainly could have gone there whenever they wanted. They could walk there, ride, you know, have their donkey or the carts, or in the case of the Lochrans, or you know, horse carts and carriages. Um, the the fact that anything that I could find that happened on the Hill of Tara, I would put in, you know, historically, because I named my book partially. I named it Farewell to Tara, because of the Hill of Tara and and how important that is, just Tara to mm -hmm. Ireland, and that it was right there where my family came from, and I was just so pleased when Daniel O'Connell had a monster rally there. I loved that. And of course, I'm going to put that in the book and make it kind of a big deal because it was a big deal then. And that, of course, uh, the, as far as the Clinton, this is a this is a, a chapter at where I wrote about the Clintons, and this is right before the, the the famine itself, the inception of it, that John Clinton, Patrick's father, went to the Monster Rally along with some of his friends. And, fam and his brother, who really, they existed, they went there and they experienced it. And so I wrote about it and I wrote about it from their perspective. Did they actually go, did, did John Clinton, who really existed, actually go to the rally? I have no <laughs> way of knowing that. But I found it hard to believe that he would not have considering how many people went from all over County Meath and either from, from also neighboring counties. They went there and, and it was within you know, a day's walk there and back for him. The fact that he would, would not have gone seemed wrong to me. Mm. Yes, and as, as you mentioned, when you said that they went there, it's not like nowadays we can hop in a car and go there quickly. Because one thing that I took from reading your book is that I don't think I would have been I would have survived very long because it was a very tough life <laughs> that with uh, character, in particular for the Clintons, the poor laborers. That as you mentioned, it was a day's walk for him, and he was already day doing walk. some really hard work, some really hard manual labor to look after his family and their was the living conditions and just living at that time, surviving was itself a challenge. <laughs> and and they were very young and very strong people. But as, as I said as well, what I get it from the a sense from the characters is that they all care for each other and support each other, which I really liked as well, that there was you know, some hope with them, that they, you know, they weren't feeling sorry for themselves. They kept trying, they kept working to make their lives better and look after the children, which yes. I really enjoyed reading as well. And it sounds like you yourself, when you're doing this research, that you were like a detective. <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> but I see, I like doing that kind of thing. Yes. Um, it's, it's I, fascinating. I, I, yeah, you know, I, well, and I've always been interested in, um, history is my favorite subject. Hmm. Uh, since I was a child, I love history, any kind of history. It does, it just, and, and, I, and I really love family history for some reason, I, I think I must be a little strange uh, because when I talk to a lot of my family members, even my own children, they're, they're like, eh, whatever, no, I, I care, I, you know. No, I don't think I'm like and A lot of people are that <laughs> really? Yeah, but a lot of people are that way, but I love, and I was, I would always talk to my grandmothers. Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't able to know my grandfathers. Uh, one died when my dad was 12 and the other one died when I was 10 and I remember him mm. uh, I remember him but uh, but I but I wasn't old enough to really be able to really talk to him but I but my grandmothers I constantly on both sides of my family constantly ask them questions tell me tell me about my mom tell me about my aunt my uncle um, what happened you what was it like when did you know when were you born grandma what was it like what happened you know and I always wanted to know I always wanted to know no 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 I was fascinated by it so yeah. to, this was just natural for me oh, well do. we're all happy that you did that you now wrote this book that we're enjoying <laughs> uh, it, it's it, it's similar because I told as well that my my mother as well she's a bit like you in the sense that she's fascinated with family history as well and that we're doing research, we found family in Argentina and we're planning on going there once COVID ends. 
Yes. Um, but I mean, it is like it's like a rabbit hole that you get into once you start finding more and more information, meeting people, finding out about people that, you know, it's fascinating. Um, yeah, it's I think and, so. Yeah. And I, I think it comes out in your book as well. That's, you know, the, the passion that you have and all the little details as well, the little rites of passage as well uh, in, in the book, how, how they lived that again is really authentic. And another thing that I, in your book as well that I like are the little illustrations of the house and of how they lived, you know, a chair, uh, yeah. to really help to picture um, how they lived. Uh, did you draw those illustrations yourself or did somebody I wish else? I could say so. No, no, no. <laughs> no, I, I, had, I had an artist do that. Um, just, an, uh, just someone that does really, uh, really good, um, simple illustrations, uh, kind of car little cartoony uh, in a bit, mm -hmm. but um, kind of cute. No, I, no, I'm not, I may be able to write, but I am mm. not somebody who, if you ever saw some of my old games like Mystery House, <laughs> one of my very first adventure games, uh, you'll see how well my, my drawing is. It's not very good. <laughs> oh, no, no. That, that's why <laughs> not I asked. Very good. <laughs> drawing is not, <laughs> no. But I did include I did include not only those little illustrations, um, but also I I liked adding some of the um, illustrations from the old newspaper and magazines from the time period, and those were authentic. Like uh, there's an illustration of Daniel O'Connell who was on, on the Hill of yes. Terra, and he was put in there. Uh, I found that illustration, and it was that was actually a current it was put in whatever whatever newspaper it was at the time because what they they didn't have photographers so what they did was they sent uh artists who were good at at doing these illustrations to to uh, take an image from an event a historical event that was happening and they would they would do really nice illustrations and now if you go onto the internet you can find them and you know, and then they, and there was a lot. Of, there was a lot of interest in this famine all over the world, but all over Europe and uh, and Australia, and definitely in the United States and Canada. And they sent reporters and journalists to Ireland to to uh, report this to the world, to bring back the reportage of it, of what was happening. And they sent artists with them. To, um, to, to capture the images, not having cameras, that's how they did it. So I was able to find some of those um, illustrations. And I also put those in the book to sort of help further the story. Yeah, well, I, I think they, they definitely work to help to at least picture the scene and as you mentioned, further the story. And there, there's one thing as well that, you know, speaking to people, you know, especially from outside of Ireland, that they always ask, how is it possible that there was a famine on an island? <laughs> because it's, uh, you know, it's, they said, can people just go fishing just oh. <laughs> to the harbor? <laughs> yeah. um, but it, right. is a, it is a very, you know, it's more complex because uh, there, there was actually a lot of food available. Um, yeah. But, but as, as you mentioned as well, you go through this in, in the book as well, why especially the poor people only ate potatoes. Uh, well, then not only potatoes, oh, but primarily. Mostly, yes. Primarily. Yeah. Uh, but I don't know if you wanted to elaborate a little bit, if you wanted to, for people to, to read about it in the book. Oh, why that? Why they weren't able to eat anything other than potatoes? Yeah, uh, from what research that you saw, that, you know, again, how, how on an island there could be this. Oh, yeah. Um, I too wondered that <laughs> at the beginning. <laughs> because you think, yeah, couldn't they just gone out and gone fishing and, yeah. you know, or hunt? <laughs> I mean, were yes. there rabbits? I mean, something. <laughs> but there, they have to sort of understand when when the when the famine started, Ireland had more than eight million people. I don't believe that Ireland is even back up to eight million. No, people. no, we're not yet. I don't day. believe. I think it's, you're six and a half, maybe seven. I, I don't something know. Something like that. Yeah, but we're not, we're eight, not million. eight. No, no, not over. It. And so there, that's a lot of people, and most of them were poor. At least I don't know if half, but probably close to half, were very poor, and and a good third were were the very poor, and um, it's a lot of people. They had very large families, 
they had very little money. They didn't own their property, most of them. So they had, they had very little resources. Now the people who lived on the coasts were able to fish to some extent in some of the fishing villages. Uh, and, they, and they also uh, harvested seaweed and they could, they could do that kind of thing. But most of the people lived in the interior and they didn't know how to fish. They were too poor to even be able to get fishing poles or anything like that, or even to get to the to the coast. They they didn't uh, the the really poor people. They didn't have horses. They didn't have even donkeys. Maybe some of them they might have had access to donkeys, but they mostly walked and they mm. mostly just lived in their areas because to you couldn't really walk too far, and so they were just sort of stuck. Mm. and uh they just they didn't have much money and, and most of them lived on somebody else's property the big landowner you know, like almost like plantations so they were really tied in they were tied into these plantations and they they just they they had their little plot of land and they could plant some little bit you know the potatoes or whatever and but they owed to these they owed their rent to these landowners had to pay their rent and they also had to not just money but also many in many cases had to also perform uh services and labor for the landowner the who had the big farm and who, maybe wheat you know come out and help with the harvest or whatever they had to do that so they couldn't really be running off to the coast and uh fish i mean that just wasn't right. really feasible <laughs> right yeah no that's uh i mean that that makes sense because it Remember, they were inland, and it's not that easy to go no. places. <laughs> well, you can't just get in a car and drive there. No, no, no. <laughs> it was very but difficult. It's uh, yeah, that that's one thing that I find like, oh, I don't know how I would have survived in you know this time. Uh, yeah. But 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 then and then, uh, what I wanted to ask you as well because most people know you, I'm sure, from the games that you've made and that you've written for, and now that you're writing this book and hopefully more books in the future. Um, what did you find any particular differences uh, between writing for games and for this book as well, or any particular challenges? Or do you have a preference now for writing? Well, um, it's interestingly, I found writing a book harder. Okay. Even though my games, you know, my games, uh, you know, starting with Mystery House, but uh, mostly well known, I guess, for King's Quest. And then, um, and then uh, Phantasmagoria, uh, more towards the end of my uh, game writing career. Um, for some reason, I, I mean, I've always been a storyteller. I think as a kid, I was always telling stories. Uh, I used to tell my mom I wanted to write children's books when I grow up or movie scripts or, you know, always in sort of a story idea that that's where I was going to go in life. Uh, Either that or an archaeologist. That was my other one. I wanted to be an archae, you know, in history. You know, again, that's the history. Mm. Um, and so, stories and history have always been something in my mind. And I've all, I think, I sort of think of myself as a natural storyteller. And so, coming up with these games that were are, were interactive stories. They're games, yes but they were also interactive stories and they, but, but the stories of, a, of an adventure game, they're there obviously, but they're not real detailed. They're, they're sort of broad, you know, sort of a, a almost about as broad as you might think of maybe a, a fairy tale. You take a, um, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, for, for instance, that's a story. I wouldn't call it a real detailed story, not like a book like this that I wrote. It, it's a story, it's, it's, a, it's a fanciful story. It's, um, uh, it, it you know, has a beginning, a middle and an end and uh, climaxes and everything else. And, um, but not really, really detailed, kind of a, I don't wanna use the word simplistic, but an easy story. Right. And so my, my adventure games were all, I, I would say they were kind of like that. They were sort of easy stories, easy to get into. 
and explore through it. And you could add a lot of fanciful details in it uh, to make it more, more interesting to explore. And characters could come and go and you could meet them and, and engage with them with my games. But I had to be able to add puzzles and uh, to be able to solve puzzles and to be able to explore regions and uh, so you get more of a sense of exploring, maybe almost than you do of you're in a story. Um, inventory objects that you can use and, and obstacles and, and mazes and things like that. That So the story could not be too, too complex in order to be able to make it interactive and exploratory. It, it had to be a more wide open story. But a book, especially a book like this, is obviously has to be more detailed. It, it has to be more descriptive. It's told in a more linear way. It's told in a, totally a linear way from beginning to end. Uh, I don't have any players that are messing with it, you know, getting in there and saying, no, 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 I don't want to do that. I want to go over here instead, you know. With my games, I had to all I knew that people when they play my games, they're, they're not going to want to follow a script necessarily. <laughs> they're going to want to go off and do some other things. And I had to be able to make sure that happened. Uh, this book, though, you have no choice. You're going to read this book. You have to follow it the way I wrote it. And you have no choice in the matter. So therefore, my job now is, is changed from making sure my story is explorative for the, a player to decide where he or she would want to go and what they, he or she wants to do, but yet come back to a story at some point. I always made sure you come back to it. And then you can explore some more. But this one, not to keep your interest from beginning to end. And that I found much different. And for me, actually harder. Okay. It was harder for me. Right, yeah, to keep to make it more linear, maybe that uh, I have to be more descriptive. Mm. I have to I have to describe what's happening, right, in in ways that I didn't have to do in an adventure game. Right, yeah, it's also quite different to a lot of it. We mentioned King's Quest. This is very different. Oh yeah, um, <laughs> yeah very different. <laughs> very um, different. But is and is there a uh, do you do you plan on writing any follow-ups uh, to this book? Do you write on continuing the story of your family? That would would you like to do that, or well, do you have any other plans? It depends. <laughs> I mean, I think to a certain extent, it depends on how well this does. I mean, you know, if uh, I mean, I think it's I, I think it's a good book. I feel proud of it. Um, I I don't think I did a bad job, <laughs> um, but it is it's not something that people that have played my games would necessarily expect from me. And it is, it is kind of, um, it's, I don't want to use the word hard sell, but in a sense it is. Mm. Um, it, it just, it doesn't fit the, you know, I think people would expect something from me like Harry Potter, right. <laughs> you know, maybe, or Outlander, you know, one of those where I do, I did, uh, I explore history, but then you put in time travel and some fanciful aspects and that kind of thing, which I think I'm, I totally could do. I don't think I'd have a problem with that at all, uh, but I didn't do that in this book. You know, I really stuck to actual history. And, and part of it is because I was in this, this whole period of genealogy that I was doing at the time. And I was totally taken by it. I was just totally drawn into it. I loved it. And so I just started, I started writing the book for my family, for my children, for posterity. Because it was funny because when I started looking into these people, the Clintons, the Lochrans, I started thinking in my mind, God, it's such a shame that I know all the stuff about them and this interesting time period in Ireland. And, and, I, and I'd love to be able to write something about it 
to tell people about it, not only the people of Ireland themselves that I don't even know how much is taught in school in Ireland. I know that in the United States, you'd be surprised how little of our own history is really taught. Similar anymore. here, actually. It's <laughs> yeah. And it's, it amazes me in the United States, in Canada, probably, I don't know about England, and I don't, and I really don't know about Ireland, Ireland but I'm just thinking how, how little may be taught about our own history that wasn't even that long ago. Mm -hmm. And it just seemed to me that maybe somebody just needs to do it. And I just, I put it upon myself and why I did that. I'm not really sure, but I did. Well, so as, as to a second book, uh, honestly, uh, I had thought, well, if it does reasonably well, I, I probably would because, but then it, it, the second part, I was thinking it'd be at least in two parts, Ireland. And this is the part I wrote the second part. New York, because a lot happened in New York. If you, there's like the gangs of Ireland, I mean, the, the gangs of New York. Yes. Book, very famous a movie was made out of it about the Irish. Um, of course, this was later in time. I think the, mm -hmm. the gangs of Ireland was a little, I mean, of New York was a little later in time or maybe early 1920s, 1910s. But it, it, it was happening the same in, in, in New York, the Irish tenements, the, you know, the Irish need not apply for jobs. The Irish had a very hard time in New right. York when they were in Boston, when they were immigrating in a very hard time. And, uh, and then they, um, Patrick, he also, he, he um, enlisted in the, in the Navy and fought in the Civil War, and he was injured. And so there's a lot of really, and I know every place he lived, he, he immigrated in, in 1862 into New York. And I know every address where he lived in New York and what he did. And I know everywhere he was in the Civil War. So there's a lot more that I could write. And in fact, maybe even more so and to get into the into the civil war. So there's I have a lot of information to do that. But I I really need to see how well this does, well, I guess. Well, I for one really hope it sells well then. A bestseller. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, at least enough, you know, for me to 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 go on. So, uh but if not, I might I might decide just to do some sort of fantasy. Who knows? No. Who knows? And, Who might... knows? Who knows? You might get you might get lucky with the Netflix deal as well. Maybe to put this on the screen. I, I would love I'm that. Let's see how well this goes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I for one. That's where one, you're coming. That's where you're coming in. You're gonna I'll, help me. I'll do my best. Uh, pe <laughs> You'll people, do your best. <laughs> people listening, please buy this book because I can say that it's from. Read the it, word. It is really, really good. I'm really enjoying it. Read and, the word. <laughs> I will certainly do what I can. Oh, and then. Okay. Uh, the, the the last question you, you could make an adventure game out of this either that would <laughs> i don't think so i, no. I don't see that <laughs> uh, any for the last question people have to will want me to ask you is, would there be any possibility that you or ken would get back into making games at some point or are you focused on writing books at the moment uh right now ken ken just uh finished a book as you may know i think you know yes uh, called not all fa not all fairy tales um oh god it was it not have all fairy tales have happy endings have happy endings <laughs> yes oh, you killed me I, didn't know that. <laughs> I knew that i just uh yeah and uh and he and he did very well with that book oh happy to hear yeah he did he did uh it was uh, about sierra online and uh us ken and i starting it and and all the various trials and tribulations we had with it so and how it ended up and and so i think he's kind of liking that and i'm very interested now into exploring writing so i think probably i don't i don't see any any adventure games or games from us at this point okay, never well, say never but yeah, you never know but well as long as you're writing that we're getting new stories from you that's <laughs> that well, i guess is the main thing uh and wh where can people find out more about uh, the book 
then if they want to well it's it, available it. on amazon okay so you good. just go to amazon and type in uh farewell to tara it is um under the historical fiction category it's kind of way down the list i'm Hope we get it, it back up. <laughs> I hope, well, I hope it gets up the list, but it's there. It's there. You'll find it. Um, and uh, it. Uh, trying to think if it. I, I think it's maybe in the Irish historical novels as well. But I'm not. I'm not a hundred percent sure on that. But it's on Amazon. Okay, and there's a Kindle version as well, which is what there's I'm reading. There's a Kindle version. There's a Kindle version, and also, and I'm going to have an audio version. I've got the the narrator, all an actress, all picked out. I oh wow, decided to go with a female voice because I wrote the book. It made sense to me, of course. And she's American, although she is of Irish ancestry too. Uh, her name is Rosemary Benson. She uh, and she does a great Irish accent. So uh, she's going to be doing that in mid May. So I'm hoping that the audio version will be available by June. Okay. Well, I, I look forward to hearing it. And uh, definitely I'll do what I can to spread the word because <laughs> I, I want to know what happens next. I want to know what keeps happening to, to your family, to these, these characters. characters. <laughs> I'm invested now. Well, you get <laughs> back in the book and finish it. You're going you're gonna to read more about the Lochrans now. Oh, absolutely. I look you're gonna forward start, to You're going to start seeing the difference now mm. between the Lochrans and the Clintons. It's going to start making, that, that part's going to be more clear. That's the other aspect of this book I found, in, found interesting is the difference between these two families and how they, um, they went through the Great Famine and how their lives were so different from each other. But yet, I, a little spoiler here, they, came to, they come together. You're going to see how they come together in the end. Oh, very nice. I look, I genuinely look forward to, to reading more to finding out uh, because I'm reading, I've read about halfway through in two days and uh, I, I look forward to reading more. Um, Thank you, so, Georgia. Uh, is there anything else, Roberta, that you'd like to mention that we haven't covered? Um, hmm. I think we did a pretty good job. <laughs> I think we've <laughs> covered a yeah. lot. Well, people listening, go out and buy the book and get it on Amazon and uh, and yeah, because I think people would really enjoy it, the Irish people and anyone, because as we've mentioned, this had a huge effect, not just in Ireland, but around the world, uh, oh, oh, in this huge. tiny country. <laughs> Very much so. And I think I looked up once that um, of, of the presidents of the United States, to, to over 20 of them, I believe, who had uh, Irish ancestry became president. Yeah, that, I mean, that's, uh, we, that's we could spend a lot amazing. more time. When JF you think about JFK was from my town in Wexford. But you'd be uh, surprised how many of mm. uh, the prior presidents of the United States um, have Irish ancestry. You'd be amazed how many. And that's how well they have done. I'm very, I'm very proud to be Irish. Yes. No, I'm <laughs> half Irish. I mean, half Irish. <laughs> we, we will although, I am very, although I am very Celtic because um, my dad was half German, but he was half Welsh. Oh, wow. My mom was all Irish, so <laughs> I'm very Celtic. Well, we, we reclaim you as, your, as our own. We, <laughs> we'll fight for you. <laughs> Perfect. Fight for it. <laughs> uh, well, thank you so much, Roberta. It really has been a, an honor and a pleasure for me to speak to you. And, thank you. Uh, and I hope to, to speak to you again. I hope to hear more about the second book and the continuation of this series. And well, I we'll wish see. You the, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. I wish you the Here's very, that. very best of luck then. Thank you, Shorsha.